Let's turn to our Bibles and we're reading from 1 Samuel, the whole of chapter 3. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. That's 1 Samuel, chapter 3. Now the boy named Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass all that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to, to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was. And while Samuel was lying down, and the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call, lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. <clears throat> he answered, I did not call you, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know, yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in, in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called at all, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. Now I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall be, not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel laid down until morning, and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God, do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me, for all the things that he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything. He hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Bathsheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Silo, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Silo by the word of the Lord. Praise God for his word. I'll invite Paul to come and bring the message which is laid upon his heart. <clears throat> it's lovely to be with you this morning. Um, we had a very trying trip uh, from about halfway up Macquarie Pass Right way through to Winslow was pea soup fog. Uh, we drove along literally at some cases of less than 60 kilometres an hour just hoping that nothing stupid jumped out in front of us or that uh, you know we didn't suddenly encounter a car going slowly in front of us or someone pulling out of a driveway. So it was a, a fairly stressful trip. And uh, we stopped at Winslow and had breakfast with our friends, the Brueggemans, and walked outside and... It wasn't sunny, but at least you could see your head in front of your face. Um, apparently, uh, I said to David, uh, what was the fog like earlier? And he said when he arrived and opened up the post office, he said he could not see the railway crossing on the other side of the road. That's how thick the fog was. So, um, but, you know, God is good. We've travelled 
hundreds of thousands of miles in the service of the Lord, and God has always looked after us. And uh, we intended to be here, and uh, nothing, well, nothing did stop us, but we, we intended that nothing would stop us. So, it's a joy to be with you this morning, and let's uh, trust that the Lord, as we've already prayed, uh, will bless us. Um, I'm still looking forward to the nobles coming, <laughs> and, and when they do come, I'd still like to come down and meet them, but <laughs> it just mm, didn't work out. <clears throat> All right, last time I preached, I introduced the book of 1 Samuel. And the story of Samuel, up to the time that his mother Hannah took him up to the tabernacle in Shiloh and left him there. She was only going to see him once a year from then on. You mothers imagine what it would be like to relinquish perhaps a 10-year-old boy to somebody with the knowledge that you'd only see him once a year for the rest of his life, or for the rest of your life probably. It's a huge commitment that Hannah made. <clears throat> God, in the meantime, through the ministry of his faithful, unnamed prophet, delivered a message of doom to Eli and his two corrupt sons and the rest of his lineage. The prophet said Eli would die. He was already old, so he was going to die anyway, but the prophet prophesied that he would die, and we'll get to the story and find that he did, and that his two sons would die on the same day, which they did. If you've read ahead, you know the story. And that none of his lineage would accede to the priesthood or even live to the normal age that people would live in those days. So all of Eli's lineage was going to die prematurely because of Eli's sins in not disciplining his children and Eli's son's sins in their behaviour. Plainly, the birth and apprenticeship of Samuel was set to usher in a complete change to the order of religion in Israel. And that's exactly how it transpired. We left the young man Samuel in the tabernacle, with no godly example from Eli or his sons, but apparently being protected by God from following their evil ways. And when the time is right, God moves on to the development of his plan. And that's the passage we read this morning. We're going to read and expound the whole passage and I'm going to bring some thoughts concerning some of its concepts at the end. <clears throat> Unlike any other book in all of history, because it's an inspired book, the Bible wastes no words. You could read through War and Peace and with a constructive red pen could probably reduce it to maybe seven-eighths of its total volume by cutting out some of the stuff that isn't really important. You could probably do that with most books in the whole of history, but you can't do it with the Bible because every word is inspired by God and every word is important. That's why, as I always urge you, read your Bible slowly and carefully. Listen to the words. They are all important. So here in chapter 3... The opening verse is not just a literary link between the giving of Samuel to the tabernacle to what happened next. These words are important in their own right. Now the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord before Eli, to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in that day. There was no widespread revolution, revelation. The authorised version says there was no open vision. I think, on balance, and I've got a foot in both camps, you know that, I suspect, I think personally, that that's a better expression of what the situation was than perhaps uh, widespread revelation. First of all, on a technical note, the fact that there was no widespread revelation or open vision makes this statement quite remarkable in itself. Because it shows us that Samuel, the writer, who is living in that era, is able and inspired by God to make an assessment of the spiritual character of the age, which it would be more appropriate for us to make, living in an age where there is a widespread revelation in Jesus Christ. So Samuel here, in the writing of his own story, is inspired by God to make a technical assessment of the character of his age while he's still living in it. 
That's pretty remarkable. And once again, that little stamp of God's authority on his written word. But as he ministered to the Lord before Eli, who had no spiritual revelation of his own, Samuel is about to become one of the rare Old Testament exceptions to the situation of there being no widespread revelation. I want to return to a post-Pentecost exposition of the rarity of revelation later. Not today. I may well deal with that in one whole sermon uh, next in the series of Samuel, even though it doesn't follow the narrative it is important to the rest of the story as well, and I think we should look at it in a little more detail. <clears throat> so, Samuel the boy in the tabernacle, the hero of our story, so to speak, sets us the scene. And again, as with my earlier statement regarding the importance of the actual wording of Scripture, what does Samuel tell us of his own experience? Remember, this is Samuel telling his own story. And he's probably writing this 60 years after it happened. Maybe, I don't know how old Samuel lived. But he wouldn't have lived past 100, at least. I'm sure he lived probably less than that. It came to pass that while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down. So there's about three or four little phrases upon which the rest of the narrative is dependent, and each one of those is important in itself. Now, there's a few things we have to assume here. And I know I always tell you, you can't argue scripture from silence, but the evidence leads us to some conclusions, even though it doesn't explicitly state it. Firstly, the tabernacle was a very small building. And according to, as we can see from Exodus, when it was built, it made no provision for people to actually live in it. It was just a house of worship. And that therefore, over the years, or perhaps even straight away in 1500 BC when it was first built, it would seem that outbuildings, so to speak, or maybe even buildings attached to the tabernacle, were created so that the priests or the priests of the day and the other attendants to sacrifices and worship could live nearby and carry out the necessary offerings and sacrifices. Remember, the Levites were there also. They were the attendants of the tabernacle. So you're looking at each day a small group of people having to be in the tabernacle every single day. Did they? Now, when they're out in the desert, of course, the nation, it's a big nation, but still, you know, they could travel from wherever it was that they lived, and the Levites were grouped around in the first group around the tabernacle, wouldn't have had to travel very far, but it would seem that by Samuel's day, they had built some buildings in so the priests could stay there. Because now, of course, the people of Israel are scattered throughout the whole of the land, from Dan to Beersheba, as it was. And so, the people there were carrying out their worship. When the children of Israel entered the land and the Levites were scattered amongst all the tribes, it would have been very necessary for the priests to stay close to the tabernacle. Now, we've just past Christmas and we've looked again at Luke and the early chapters of Luke and you remember the story of Zacharias in the first chapter of Luke and we read that Luke was that <laughs> Zacharias that Luke that Zacharias was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division in the temple have you wondered what that meant it would seem to indicate that there was a roster of sorts and that priests were rostered on for a period of time in the temple and then rostered off and other priests came and took their places. Now, when they're living in the land, that's fine. They can go off to their homes at any one of the places where they lived. But someone had to stay nearby every single day for the duration of the roster to carry out the services of the tabernacle and the temple. It seems here that Eli and Samuel lived in quarters near to or perhaps even attached to the tabernacle. It would seem that the rotation of priests in Zacharias's day was a later invention brought about by the fact that the priests and the Levites were scattered throughout the whole of the land. Now, I'm making some assumptions there, but I think they're fairly fair assumptions. They have no huge bearing on the story except for us to know that Samuel and Eli were right next to the tabernacle when this important event in Samuel's life happened. In Eli's day, the priest lived at the temple, at the tabernacle, for the whole of his life. 
and the priest served as priest until he died. And then one of his sons, his oldest son usually, took his place as the next high priest. Eli is old. His eyesight is failing him. Nighttime must have come as a relief to this old man because the ministry of the tabernacle made no provision for some of its services to be scaled back or omitted. We might say here that when it gets a bit too hard to do some things, we'll pare the service back a little bit. I'm not quite sure how we can make it any more trim and slim than it is already, but you understand the concept that I'm saying there. In those days, whatever had to be done had to be done every single day, and the priest had to do it. I have no doubt that Eli was pretty tired as an old man by the end of the day. Everybody who came to the tabernacle had to have the priest meet the requirements of their offerings and sacrifices and their prayers. Now, the lamp of God phrase has puzzled many expositors, but it ought not. It is not suggesting in verse 3 that the light of the glory of God went out in the tabernacle. The glory of God never dimmed. And anyway, it was only ever seen by the high priest alone once a year when he went into the holy place on the Day of Atonement. So Samuel would have known whether the light was on or off as the glory of God because he would never have got to see it in the whole of his lifetime. So how is Samuel going to say before it went out? This would seem to be to indicate that although there is no uh, plan for it uh, in the original plan of the tabernacle, the tabernacle in time came to be lit during the evening times and then the lights were put out when the priests went to sleep. Now I'm making some guesses there, but I certainly want to make sure that you understand that the light, the fire, the glory of God never went out. The glory of God never goes out. And so Samuel, like his master, lay down to sleep. And then we read that the Lord called Samuel. Samuel. I want to come back to the concept of the call of God later at some distance. But at the moment, just the narrative. All is quiet in the living quarters of the tabernacle. And just before Samuel's eyes close in sleep, God calls. God calls him individually. This is not a loud blast of God that every single person can hear. In fact, in the very next room, Eli is asleep. but He doesn't hear it. But Samuel hears the Lord's call. We know the story well, don't we? It's one of our Sunday school stories. It's one of those little stories in Scripture that we all grew up with. And we were all taught the truths of that story. And we all remember, do we not, the truths of that story. God calls Samuel twice. Twice, Samuel assumes it's Eli calling him and goes to ask Eli. But Eli says, no, it wasn't me. Go back to sleep. I'm not sure that Samuel was asleep. And I'm not sure now, given the disruption, that he was going to sleep. Remember that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Samuel had no reason to expect God to, cook, to talk to him. God wasn't talking to anybody directly. The unnamed prophet had come and he had delivered a message. And God undoubtedly had spoken to him. But the message of God to Eli and his sons and to Samuel as a secondary cause was delivered by a prophet. Samuel had no reason to assume that God was calling him. There's only one other person alive in the vicinity that he knows of and it's Eli. And Eli two times denies, no, it wasn't me. The third time he runs to Eli again. Eli is old. His eyesight is just about gone. And his neglect of the proper education of his sons shows that the spiritual instincts that he showed while talking to Hannah perhaps 10 or 12 years earlier, as she prayed at the door of the temple, are now dulled as well. But in a flash of inspiration, no doubt, from God, Eli suddenly has a light bulb moment. And Eli says to the boy, it must be God. It must be God talking to you. Go back, lie down, and if the voice comes again, we read this, Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. And therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went, bout, went and lay down in his place. Samuel obeys and waits. 
I'm not sure that Samuel was intending to sleep at this stage. I'm not sure, given what Eli has just said, that it would have been possible for him to sleep. This is one of these dropping the second shoe moments, isn't it? Something is going to happen. I just don't know when or how. And of course, every word of Scripture is important. The first two calls we read that God called Samuel. Now look at your Bible. Do you know what it says next? Now we read that the Lord came and stood and called Samuel. Did you notice that? Now the first one and the second one is the voice of God coming from the heavens, coming from or into a place where Samuel can hear it. Now God has got his attention and now God comes and stands as it were at the foot of of Samuel's bed and calls him the third time. It's spine-tingling stuff, isn't it? Or it should be. God is not speaking from heaven now. He's speaking with the lad in the intimacy of his bedroom. And God visited Abraham personally, didn't he? Turned up at the door of his tent without so much as saying, I'll be there tomorrow. He just turned up. But it was certainly God who just turned up. He's again calling Samuel by name. Samuel, Samuel. The voice is right there. It's dark. Samuel sees nothing. But obedient to the, device, to the advice of his master, he answers in the words that Eli has given him. 10b, Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. So this is one of those hold your breath what's going to happen next moments in scripture, isn't it? God has come down to Samuel's room to visit him. He hasn't done it just because of no reason. He has something. He wants this young man's attention. He's only 10 years old, maybe 12 years old tops. He wants this boy's attention. What is he going to say? Now, God's got his attention. He goes straight into the message, 11 to 14. It's a terrifying tirade. Not against Samuel, but against the system that's going on that Samuel is becoming part of. I will do something in Israel at which both the ears of everyone who hears it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them and therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever hey, brethren you know the scriptures pretty well. There's not too many more fearful words in scripture than those words. And we've dealt with the doctrine of reprobation aspect of this message before. We don't need to go there again. <clears throat> but God tells Samuel that the judgment which he'd earlier promised, remember the unnamed man of God who came and said, the judgment which he had said is going to proceed. Samuel will see these things happen. And it cannot have taken long for the implication of these things happening for him to have percolated into his young mind. If God is going to destroy Eli and destroy Eli's sons, where will that leave me? Well, we're wise enough to know. Why did God call Samuel? For that reason. For exactly that purpose. And we're on the other end of the story. We've read the last chapter, haven't we? We know how it all plays out. With that we read in verse 15, Samuel lay down until the morning. I noted here in my notes, note it doesn't say that he slept. He just lay down. I'm wondering, I'm perhaps if I'd have been Samuel, I'm not sure I would have slept terribly well after receiving that sort of message. But life goes on. And duties go on. We read that next in the morning, he opened the doors of the house of God. Business as usual. He must have dreaded having to talk to Eli. You got good news for me? Well, actually, no. <laughs> but Eli calls him 
and demands that he tell him everything that God has said. He says, you will be cursed if you do not tell me everything that God said. He puts him on oath. You must tell me. Whatever God said, you must tell me every word of it. And so we read that he told him everything and hid nothing from him. Verse 18. Eli, for all his faults, philosophically accepts the judgment of God in the message. We read in 18b, he said, it's the Lord. Let him do whatever seems good to him. Now, Eli can't wind back 70 or 60 years of neglect of the education of his sons. He can't put his hand up and say, I'll do better with my sons from now on. It's too late. It's too late. We prayed this morning for members of our families. It's not too late for them until the Lord Jesus comes back. But it is too late to put their feet in the right paths of righteousness if they're already married and got their own kids and their kids have got their own kids. That's something we could have done and should have done a long, long time ago. We now have to live with the consequences of whatever we did, which was right, and whatever we didn't do or failed to do, which has resulted in the situation where it is. God is sovereign in all these things. But it's a salutary warning, nevertheless. And so, for Eli, life will soon end, ignominiously, as we know. And for Samuel, life goes on, into a path he could barely have imagined. Hannah and his mother is never mentioned again. But in chapter 2, the scriptures tell us that she had five more children after Samuel. And so God blessed her for her faithfulness. I've no doubt somewhere today... Some perverted preacher is making that a proof text for prosperity doctrine. You give something to God, God will give you more back. That's rubbish. God never promised when he promised to give Samuel that if she would give Samuel, he'd give her more kids back. She did what she did because that was what she wanted to do. She had no promise of reward for taking the boy up to the tabernacle and leaving him there. God graciously gave her a reward after she had done what she faithfully promised to do. And that's how God works. So Samuel grew, we read, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. God has spoken to Samuel, and God stays with Samuel. Samuel, for his part, hangs on every word of God. Samuel is blessed. It's amazing when you're preparing, preaching how the, the, the intellectual concordance system of the scriptures kicks in in your brain. And God has got you here and he cross-references you to something over there. You know what I mean? And as I was writing this, I thought to myself, Psalm 1 is not Samuel an embodiment of what the psalmist says That blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord and in that law he meditates day and night. And Samuel is that sort of man. This inner relationship with God has an outward manifestation. We read in verse 20, All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Notice carefully the Spirit of God superintends the wording here. He is not going to succeed Eli as priest. Although throughout his life he performs many priestly functions. But Israel has a new major prophet. Unlike the more recent judges. But much more like the legendary Moses. A man who is the leader of the people in all aspects of their life. Leading them in righteousness as Moses did. The nation has been leaderless. Now there is hope in the new leader for all the tribes. And then this, look at verse 21. The Lord appeared again in Shiloh. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Samuel's first meeting with God was not his last meeting with God. They didn't tell us that in Sunday school, did they? I don't remember that. Just remember the first bit. Speak your servant here. In fact, if you look at the other people to whom God appeared, like Abraham and Jacob and Moses, the testimony is that God appeared to them once and then stayed with them. At least once more in this time frame, we're going to look at the whole of Samuel's life, the Lord appeared to Samuel. So God maintains a relationship with Samuel 
And Samuel maintains his relationship with God. And I don't think it's too far to say that just as in the night in the tabernacle that first time, Samuel had said to God, speak your servant hears, that that continued to be the attitude of Samuel's heart. That when God spoke, he would listen. Brethren, we've got churches today full of people who go to church for all sorts of reasons, but a lot of them aren't there to hear God speak. A lot of them go there and they're not prepared to listen. One of the joys of preaching in this church is that even though I preach forever and even though you get tired, I understand all of that. The joy and confidence as we drive home to Wollongong each day is to know that people came to church to listen to the word of God. And that thrills my socks off. I have to tell you that. So, we don't know what God said the second time or the third time or the fourth time, but having called Samuel to serve him, it's not a big leap to say that God then returned to teach him how to do it. So the stage is set for the life and ministry of one of the great prophets of God, a man who will change Israel from being a disconnected network of tribes spread throughout the land from Dan to Beersheba back to being a nation with a national and uniform identity as they were at the Exodus and the year and a bit that followed. Israel, not this stage of proceedings, is not a nation. Israel is a whole lot of tribes scattered around having <coughs> brawls between themselves, killing each other's children, following judges, following idols. It's a mess. And God has done something to address the mess. He will give Israel its first two kings and bring down the first one. He will set the nation's leadership in stone for the next 1,000 years up to the time the temple is destroyed and the children of Israel are scattered from off the land in 70 AD. After the disjointed and disgraced years of the judges, Samuel is the great reinventor of Israel. And that's his position in history. And that's his position in Scripture. I'm not going to go there now. But if you notice verse 1 of the next chapter, it says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. So Samuel isn't just a prophet. Samuel is a preaching prophet. Every person in Israel gets to hear what Samuel is saying and listens to his words and, we guess, are obedient to his words. The nation is on the upswing after nearly 400 years of darkness under the judges. And Samuel is the man who drives the religious agenda. Not the priests. Samuel is the man who drives the religious agenda. The work of the tabernacle continues. Another priest takes Eli's place. And another priest takes his place. Samuel is the man who drives God's agenda into the hearts and minds of the people of Israel. Now, I want to come back and talk about the call of God. Few subjects have had as much discussion in church life over the last 50 years, and certainly in most of my adult life, than the concept of the call of God to ministry. As with all other aspects of life, this once settled concept was questioned and in many minds set aside, along with creation, original sin, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, and the second coming as an inevitable consequence. But doctrines which question or set aside the clear teaching of the word of God and the clear teaching of biblical history at least have a consequence if acted upon. And the consequences of the setting aside of the observed and taught doctrine of God calling people to ministry has had drastic and awful consequences in the last 50 or 60 years of the life of the church. I am sure elsewhere, certainly in this country. Certainly in this country. Now we need to have a line of distinction here, just to shut off any wiggle room from the heretics. So let's do that. We are all called by God to proclaim the gospel. All of us. Uniformly and without distinction. We are all called by God to live holy lives. All of us. Uniformly and without distinction. We are all called by God to love one another 
and to serve one another and to minister to one another's needs as we see opportunity to do so. I'm sure Samuel, the night he lay down in the tabernacle, was not expecting God to call him to be one of the great prophets of Israel. Last thing from his tender young mind. But that was God's plan. Just Samuel had to be let in on it, that's all. Moses, likewise, we read that he thought that God would use him to rescue Israel. He kills the uh, Egyptian oppressor. He gets caught out and he takes a hike and goes over to Midian, spends 40 years over there. You reckon after the second or third or fourth year, Moses might have been thinking, well, I must have got it wrong. But 40 years after he gets there, he sees the burning bush and God says, Remember, it's time. And God calls him to serve him. God fleshes out. God makes intensely personal the inkling that he had 40 years earlier and hardens it into a specific call. Go down and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. We can multiply examples across the scriptures. You can think of half a dozen while I'm talking. But the heretics bleed. That was then. Times have changed. This is now. Well, yes, but no. But no. God is the same. His plan for the spread of the gospel is the same. His plan for the education of the church is the same. Hasn't changed. Hasn't changed since Pentecost. Hasn't changed in concept and function since the days that God called Samuel in the tabernacle in the dark one night back there in Shiloh. So ask yourself this then. What is the motivation in the minds of some people for breaking down this concept of a specific individual call of God to ministry as seen and taught in Scripture? Because you can't deny it from Scripture. You can only say, well, that's what happened then, but times are different now and it doesn't happen now because it clearly happens in Scripture. What's the motivation for people to saying, let's set aside the evidence of Scripture and say we ought not to be expecting that in our day? What's the motivation for that? Is it not so that anybody can accede to ministry? Is it not? Regardless of fitness or qualification? Is it not so that women may accede to the pulpit or even to the high offices of the church as bishops and archbishops. And I have no doubt whatsoever if the Lord doesn't come back soon, we will end up with a female archbishop of Canterbury as the head over the whole of the Church of England. It's only a matter of time. Is it not so the homosexuals and other people who are precluded by the express teaching of Scripture may accede to high offices in the organised church? Could that be the reason for saying God doesn't call people anymore? In other words... Because I want to, I can. Or because I think so and so should, he or she should. I can't think of one other reason. I really can't. I'm not setting up a straw man here, I'm just trying to think. And yet, the Bible teaches us that God is a God who makes sovereign choices. And he does not choose anybody and everybody to teach the saints of God and to lead the people of God. He makes specific choices of people to do that. And what has been the result of this breaking down of the biblical concept of the call observed and taught of men being called to the ministry? It has been that the very people I have outlined above and hundreds of others unfit, themselves untaught, and uncalled for people are now in leadership positions of churches all around the world wreaking havoc on people's souls and the rich heritage which they have inherited but which they and their forebears are now destroying. Timothy's picture in 2 Timothy of the apostate church in the time before Jesus' return is being hastened by the accession of anybody who wants the job of leading the church getting it. Whether they're fit, trained, called, or even, as I'm sure in most cases, even born again to begin with. What chance does the body have if the head is rotten? 
But God did and does and will call people to serve him in specific roles for sovereign reasons. We must believe that he does this and be prepared to hear him when he does. Samuel was not expecting God to call him, but he was in the right place and was unbeknown to him of a godly heritage that made him an ideal choice for God. He was prepared to listen. And when attuned to God and his message, he was prepared to obey. It's very, very simple. God calls the people who he chooses and God makes them ready and God makes them willing to obey. If they need a little bit of a nudge along, like Samuel did, like Eli said, if the voice comes again, say, speak, Lord, your servant hears, what would it have been if it wasn't God? No harm done. But Eli's at least wise enough in his old age to say, it might be the Lord. Say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. If it is the Lord, then something's going to happen. And it did. I referred in one of my recent radio talks to the commissioning of the first servants of the church in the Acts chapter 6 narrative. And I suggested in that, that in the application of that message, that just because a man is good with figures, it may not be the best person to be the church treasurer. It's logical. It's rational. And depending on the size of the church, it might be the only choice. But it doesn't mean that that's God's call. It just means that man with figures meets pocket of money and the two naturally get together. Samuel had no known skills at 10 years old to make him an obvious choice on God's part to be God's prophet. As he grew and lived and God gave him those skills, and guidance that he needed, he grew into the man that God had planned him to be. God often calls, as I have always suggest, already suggested, against the run of play. But not always. Consider Saul of Tarsus, a fearsome scholar of the Old Testament, well taught in the scriptures as anyone alive. He calls himself later a Pharisee of the Pharisees in the, concerning the righteousness of the law, blameless. This man's at the top of the tree. So, good choice, right? Yeah, absolutely. Great choice. But also consider this. God sent the best student of the Old Testament to preach the gospel to the ignorant pagan Gentiles and left the church at Jerusalem full of Jews well taught in the word of God in the hands of a couple of blokes who were fishermen who'd never been to theological college. God's got a great sense of humour, hasn't he? Over all of this, we must understand that God, the all-knowing God, knows what choices to make and calls to make and what results will be. Allow me to break my own dictum to preachers about illustrating things from their own experience. I have done it once or twice. This will probably be the third time. When I went to Tali Bible College at the age of 19, I was the son of an open-air preacher. <clears throat> I went to college to prepare myself to go somewhere as an evangelistic missionary. That was what I went there for. That's what I believe God had called me to do. I didn't go there because I thought it was a nice idea. There were heaps of Bible colleges I could have gone to. God called me to go to Tali, and I, my thoughts were, and my understanding was, that I would follow in my father's footsteps and become an evangelist. I'd had lots of good training in the Word of God and in the work of God through all the years up until, up until the time I turned 19. God made my life plan very clear to me. But a month after I got to Tali and started studying the Word of God, God made it also very clear to me that my life plan was not to be an evangelist but be a Bible teacher. Now, I'm not saying you can't do both because Paul says to Timothy, who's a great Bible teacher, do the work of an evangelist. You've got to do both. But well, I had a sudden U-turn in what I perceived to be God's expectation of where my life was going to be going and why I was at college and training. All makes perfect sense now, but it was all a bit puzzling then, I must tell you. I spent the rest of the time at college making what preparations I could for that calling and I've been exercising it ever since. I never had a second of doubt that that was the call of God for me. I never had one moment of doubt of thinking maybe I should have gone and been an evangelist. No, that's what God called me to do. God called me to do this and I've been doing it ever since. I've still been doing the work of an evangelist 
but God called me to do this. I often refer to hymns because in the scriptures, with the scriptures, they are the fabric of my Christian upbringing. I think you'll remember this one from the pen of Francis Ridley Havergal. Master, speak, thy servant heareth, waiting for thy gracious word, longing for the voice that cheereth. Master, let it now be heard. What's the chorus? I am listening, Lord, for thee. What hast thou to say to me? Speak to me by name, O Master. Let it know it is. To, let me know it is to me. Speak that I may follow faster, with a step more firm and free. Where the shepherd leads the flock, in the shadow of the rock. Master, speak, though least and lowest. Let me not unheard depart. Master, speak, for O oh, thou knowest all the yearnings of my heart. Knowest all its truest need, speak and make me blessed indeed. Master, speak and make me ready. When thy voice is truly heard, with obedience glad and steady, still to follow every word, I am listening, Lord, for thee. Master, speak, O oh, speak to me. Aren't they, aren't they wonderful words? Now, brethren, many of us here, I'm finished. Many of us here have served the Lord all our lives. We have found the particular skill and gifts with which God has endued us and we've been using them for the advancement of the kingdom and for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But brethren, can I say this, even at this stage, we should be prepared, mentally at least, for God to say, I've got something different I want you to do. For God to call you to do something different. Now, don't ask me to explain what it might be. I've got enough trouble doing what I'm supposed to be doing without telling other people what they're supposed to be doing. But listen for the call of God and be prepared to obey. I spent years pastoring churches and then one day God said to me, I want you to go to Sydney and support Hazel while she fulfills the call that I have issued to her to be the principal of a Christian school. And for 10 years, I played support act to Hazel while she exercised her call. I wouldn't have expected that. I didn't expect that. I didn't have any trouble accepting it, but it was sure a surprise. But God had something he wanted done. And for the first time in our married life, it didn't include me as the primary player. Well, wonderful. God gets his job done anyway because God knows who's the best people to choose. Be prepared for God maybe, maybe not a U-turn, but maybe a slight deviation in the road. Listen for God's call and speak the words of the song. I am listening, Lord, for thee. Master, speak. Oh, speak to me. Younger listeners, there's only one here today. I'm not picking on you, mate. I'm just saying it because it's in my notes. Are you listening for the call of God? Your parents, like Hannah, have put you in the way of likelihood. Because you have been brought up in a home where God's word is loved and where the Lord Jesus Christ is loved, you are in a likely path to be called. No more likely than everybody else, but certainly more likely in terms of possibility. If God hasn't called you yet, then I suggest he almost certainly will. Eventually, you are in the faith and in the church and you should be seeking with all your efforts to find out what it is that God wants you to do specifically and to be doing it for the rest of your life. Striving to be do what you are able to do, God will call. You must be ready to say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your graciousness. We thank you, Lord, that you choose to use us mere mortals, frail and tending to sin and disobedience and selfishness to do your work anyway. That you are moulding us into the image of your Son and as you do, you find us to be more and more useful in proclaiming the gospel 
in advancing the kingdom of God and in supporting one another in our most holy faith. Bless us, Lord, we pray. I pray, Lord, this morning that every single person who hears this message may know and understand a call from you on their lives, whatever it might mean, and that might spend the whole of the rest of their lives as they may already be doing, following that call, listening and saying, Master, speak, your servant hears. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.